This week seems to be the week of a lot of current cases and lots of updates in them. There are lots of things happening in the true crime world right now. And today's case is another current case that is right smack dab in the middle of the headlines. And it's coming out of Ohio, and this case is absolutely heartbreaking. It is puzzling and has left an entire community of people just completely grief-stricken, confused, heartbroken, sad, all of the emotions. Now, I want to warn you, this one is a hard one, so please be prepared. Hey guys, my name is Annie Elise. This is 10 to Life. Now let's get right into it. This is Ten to Life with Annie Elise. 42-year-old Melissa Dunham and her husband, 46-year-old Jason Dunham, were residents of Lake Township in Stark County, Ohio. Melissa was born to Tim and Bonnie Murphy, and she grew up in Ohio, and she also attended local schools there. After graduating, she attended Westminster College and then later received her MBA from Kent State. Then she also received a master's in taxation at the University of Akron. She has worked at an accounting firm for the past 18 years called Bobber Markey Federowich Life and Careers Accounting Firm, or BMF for short, because that is a mouthful. She specialized in corporate tax forms, and in June, she was actually made a partner in the firm. She has also received recognition and a few awards in regards to her work achievements. Now, not much is known about Jason's background, but we do know that he worked in sales and business development. According to LinkedIn, he has worked for a company called POS Highway for the past six years. So not only were they seemingly very successful in their careers, they also had just a beautiful family. The two of them had their first daughter, now 15 years old, Renee, in 2008. After having Renee, they went on to have two more children, now 12-year-old Amber and 9-year-old Evan. Their family was definitely a busy family as well. The kids all attended Lake Local Schools, which I'm sure was really special for Melissa, given that she had grown up in that exact same school district and everything was so familiar to her as well. Both girls were extremely active in Girl Scouts from as early as they could be, and Evan participated in Boy Scouts as well. Melissa even volunteered with Girl Scouts and was a member of Girl Scouts of Northeast Ohio. Each year, when it came time for Girl Scout cookie sales, Melissa would have her girls send out their cookie forms, and then they would deliver the cookies and write thank you letters to all of the buyers. But the kids didn't just do Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. All three of them also participated on a swim team and were great swimmers on the Lake YMCA Titans swim team. Renee participated in the marching band, also jazz band, and Amber participated in band and cross country. So one can assume that their activities took up a ton of their time. Lots of extracurriculars going on. But besides their extracurricular activities, they all had their own hobbies and things they enjoyed doing as well. Renee loved reading, video games, drawing, and Renee was more of a tomboy and she was in charge of all of the yard work outside as well, while Amber loved sequins, sparkles, glitter, creating fashion, and baking, just doing all of the girly things, and she was in charge of the gardening piece for their home. She also would often bake things and take them over to the neighbor's house, just a sweet, joyful girl. And Evan, Evan enjoyed Legos, baseball, video games, reading. He was also super talented with his Rubik's Cube and could solve it within two minutes, which is really hard and really cool. I couldn't solve it in two hours, so props to him. The kids also adored their two dogs, Vader and Tank, and their two cats. The dogs were always with the kids. If the kids were outside, the dogs were usually right outside with them playing, and the kids were outside a lot. They loved to play outside. They were always out riding scooters, playing basketball, and just doing all of the things that kids love to do outside. However, recently, the kids weren't outside as much, and the neighbors claimed that they stopped seeing them playing as often as they had previously been, which was kind of odd and also a little concerning. And on Thursday, August 24th, police were called to the home to do a welfare check on the family. And this welfare check was around 7.31 p.m. 
After not showing up at work for two days, Melissa's coworker began to get very nervous because this was really unlike her. She took a lot of pride in her career and was a very reliable worker, as evidenced by recently becoming a partner in the firm. Now, the kids also had not shown up at school for two days. So unsure of what was going on, Melissa's coworker called and requested that that welfare check take place. So when police got there, they noticed that the cars were both at the home. The mail had not been taken in, and there were packages on the front porch. So that was obviously extremely concerning to them. Luckily, a neighbor was able to help let them into the house. The neighbor named Edmund had known Melissa and Jason for over 17 years. He had met them when they first moved into the home before they even had any children. Him and his wife knew the entire family and also the animals very, very well. So he asked police if they would let him go in first because he knew that the dogs would listen to him since they knew him, he was familiar, he could potentially gate them away if needed and just kind of have control over the situation because he was a familiar person to the family and the animals. But what they were about to encounter was what one officer has since described as the worst scene he has been a part of in his 23-year law enforcement career. All five members of the family were seemingly dead in their bedrooms. The scene was gruesome, and it was evident that this had been a very tragic event. Melissa, Jason, Renee, Amber, and Evan were all dead of gunshot wounds. The coroner arrived on the scene, and according to the Akron Beacon Journal, the coroner pronounced them all officially dead at 9.52. Shortly after 10.30 p.m., the Uniontown Police Department released an official statement on social media. The statement read in part, On Thursday, August 24th, at approximately 7.31 p.m., the Uniontown Police Department was requested for a well-being check in the 13000 block of Carnation Avenue. Upon arrival, officers located five deceased family members. This incident is being investigated as a domestic dispute that turned deadly. At this time, it is believed there are no other persons involved in this incident. Now, initially, no one knew what had happened other than the fact that it seemed to be a domestic dispute turned murder-suicide. But nobody even knew how that took place and who would have been responsible for initiating it or who the people were even until nearly 11 hours later when police released an updated statement where they released all of the names and also announced that they succumbed to gunshot wounds. Many people knew that both Melissa and Jason had concealed carry permits and each had their own guns. However, at that point, law enforcement had not said who was believed to be the one to shoot. However, over the weekend, it was made public that Jason's gun was the gun used in the shooting and that he had a gunshot wound consistent with being self-inflicted. So it appears that Jason shot each member of his family before turning the gun on himself. It has also been mentioned that the other four all possibly had multiple gunshot wounds while he only had one. But I want to be clear, I haven't seen that officially confirmed as of yet. So word, of course, spread like wildfire around the community. The community they lived in is extremely tight-knit, and that is part of why Melissa loved raising her kids there so much. So people began questioning why Jason would do such a thing. And to be quite honest, the only thing that I have seen publicly stated about Jason was stated by Edmund, who was that neighbor. Edmund said that Jason was a very nice man, but controlling. But we know that controlling doesn't automatically mean that somebody is going to be a murderer or kill their own family, their own children. So this has left many people wondering what was actually going on inside that home, especially since the kids had been outside a lot less frequently leading up to the shooting. Could there have been a divorce on the horizon? Was it just a typical couple's argument and Jason lost his cool? Was this a situation potentially like Chad Dorman where this was a means of retaliation against his wife for some reason? The investigation is still ongoing, so we don't know anything yet other than there were never any police calls to the home prior, which seems to make it all the more puzzling. There weren't ever domestic calls. There wasn't any arguing. Nobody knew the couple to argue. So everybody's trying to rationalize and piece together how this happened, why this happened, which I'm confident and I imagine that we will learn more as time goes on. 
So the community, of course, is absolutely shaken by what has occurred. And I've seen an interview that Edmund did that talked about the family. And we've been blessed to know the kids from the beginning and since they were babies till now. It's just heartbreaking. They were very, very good in helping the community. And they were a wonderful family. They, mm-hmm. We felt like they were part of our family. I've also come across so many posts that speak directly on Melissa and the children and the impact that they have had on the community as a whole. Melissa and her kids truly seem like they were just such kind, loving people, and seeing how many people around them are so shaken is beyond heartbreaking. As I mentioned earlier, Renee was a part of the high school band, and they were supposed to have an away game that Friday night. The district superintendent spoke on the tragedy and said that the band is a family, and that almost two years ago to the day, they had lost another bandmate after a surgery that they had. So that obviously hit them all hard. So he knew that this would also hit the students very, very hard and that this would be extremely difficult. So the school district went ahead and mobilized a crisis response team, which includes counselors and mental health professionals. They met with students and staff to help them navigate such a huge loss. We have a very tight knit uh, faith based community. We're going to lean on that and lean on our folks to uh, love on one another and take care of each other. Many members of the community have changed their profile photos to this heart picture in support of the Dunham family. The girls especially seemed to have some really close friends specifically from Swim and Girl Scouts. I have seen post after post of photos of the girls with their friends and one post was written by a girl who was best friends with Amber. Her post absolutely broke my heart. Part of it said, Amber, you are such a good friend. I could always talk to you about anything. The best part about you was you were my one friend that never cared about all the girly drama stuff. And whenever I had to tell you something important, you were never that one girl who always made it about herself like all the others. I will love and miss you so much. Best friends for life. I will always cherish all the memories that we made together. You were such a role model to so many people and you will never be forgotten. She went on to write a little piece to Melissa, which said, Melissa, you were my second mom, truly. You took me to all of the Girl Scout events. I am so honored to have been able to know and love you so much. I am so grateful for everything you did for me. I still can't wrap my head around the fact that you are all gone. I am so happy that I came over to your house Monday night and that I was the last person to see all of you. I feel honored that God gave me the opportunity to be the last person to see you guys. She also wrote individual pieces to both Evan and Renee, and reading those gave me an even deeper sense of who the four of them were, how they impacted those around them, and the legacy that they are all leaving behind. A candlelight vigil was held on Saturday the 26th for the family. So many people showed up, including members of the kids' Girl Scout and Boy Scout troops and friends alike. The girls' Girl Scout troop is also collecting fabric squares with words of encouragement, memories, and drawings from members of the community. They plan to piece the squares together and make a blanket for Melissa's family. On Monday of this week, a family member of Melissa's shared the obituary post for Melissa and the children. There was no mention of Jason in the Facebook post, nor was there any mention of him in the obituary. I think her family is likely choosing to separate themselves entirely from Jason, and honestly, who could blame them? The dogs and cats are also looking for new homes now, according to one family member who posted on Facebook. I did see that one neighbor had offered to take the dog, so I'm not sure if it just didn't pan out with her or if Melissa's family maybe wants the dogs away from their home after losing all of their humans at once. I'm not sure. But they updated the post saying that Melissa's parents have some potential homes, so hopefully they're able to find them all great new homes and great families to be in. It's so sad to think about what those animals might have been thinking and feeling after losing everyone and then being trapped in the home with them for what seems to be possibly an entire two-day period. This whole case is just absolutely heartbreaking, and I ask that you keep anyone close to the situation in your thoughts and prayers. I'm sure Jason's family is also grieving such a huge loss like Melissa's family. 
Losing one person is hard enough on anyone. Losing an entire family at once is beyond tragic. And if you feel inclined to do so, please leave them a kind and supportive comment in the comment section below. I'm sure anyone who knows them can use all the encouragement and support that they can get in the coming days, weeks, and months. This case is just so interesting because it's so heartbreaking on its own, but you just start to think about how common this is becoming. And I don't know if it's just now that we're being made aware of these situations more frequently, and so it's we're hypersensitive to it, but it, it just seems that there is a case of familicide almost every single week. And look, without going off on too much of a tangent, the majority of the motives in these cases is because there is a domestic dispute, there is some sort of hatred towards the other spouse, so it's a form of punishment, of retaliation. But there's also an entirely different element at play here. And I Look, I'm not going to go off into the rabbit hole here, but I do want to mention it because it's something that stuck out to me a lot in covering the Chad Dorman case. There's this level of these parents thinking that by taking the lives of their children, they are protecting their children, whether they think they're protecting their children from the other spouse, from some unknown evil out there, from some sort of satanic thing which we saw that with the santa barbara father who went and used the machete i believe it was there's just this whole other element to it now to where it's not just retaliation or punishment which is usually the typical reason or the i shouldn't say typical but the most common but now there's like this whole other element of they think they're actually saving their children and that they have to do this that they're being called to do this And that's really, really freaking scary to think about. And I'm not saying that's what this case is because we truly don't know what the motive is yet at this point. We will find out, I'm sure. But that itself really irks me. Anything where somebody feels as though they are being called to take somebody's life as a means of saving them or protecting them really freaks me out. So I'm curious to know your thoughts. Do you think that we now are just being hyper aware and hypersensitive to these types of cases because we're seeing them in the media a lot more? Or do you think that there is an uptick happening in these types of cases? It's heartbreaking. Every time we cover one, it's just it feels like a gut punch every single time. And unfortunately, they're not rare to cover. I know I'm kind of just going off on a tailspin right now and talking out loud. I just like I'm really trying to wrap my mind around it because as a parent, as a human, as somebody who talks about true crime with you guys, it's just it's really unsettling to think about and it's uh, it's just heartbreaking. So anyway, sorry, I know I kind of went off on a tangent there, but I just needed to share my thoughts and I'm curious to know what you guys think about it. Thanks so much for tuning in with me today. I know it was a difficult one to listen to. They are never easy, but I know that this one was especially difficult. So I appreciate you sticking with me. All right, guys, until the next case, please keep your loved ones close, hug them tight, kiss them extra, and stay safe. All right.